my name is Jim Ullman. I grew up in Oklahoma City. Um, am a veteran of the United States Army. I won the, the, the a national lottery. I won the draft lottery in 1969 and got a three-year all-expense-paid all tour of the finest military posts in the United States. Um, uh, after graduation from college uh, and, and from the Army, I went to Dallas Seminary where I studied for uh, the THM degree and then uh, started the doctorate. Left and pastored for a couple of years in the uh, middle of the doctoral work um, in Oklahoma City and then returned to Dallas, finished my doctorate, and in 1982 we came to Memphis to teach at a small college here. There were 100 and 29 students at the college. The, <laughs> the whole college was 129. Uh, but it was wonderful because we got to know all the students. And, but it, it also uh, kind of broadened my education because as, uh, as I was at, at the seminary, I was an Old Testament major, but at, the, at a small Bible college, you have to be a, a jack of all trades. So um, got me into systematic theology and into New Testament, and I taught Greek and um, taught church history and uh, things for which I was thoroughly unprepared. Uh, in 2000, uh, we were offered a position at Dallas Seminary to teach and we moved down there. I taught in what's called the Bible Exposition Department whose purpose is to show the students how each of the books fits together and how they all fit into the overall flow of thought and scripture. So um, I, I taught there from 2000 to 2020 um, in about 2015, I was asked also to teach in the Old Testament department, so I began to teach uh, Hebrew and Hebrew exegesis. In 2020, it became a it, it was it was just the right time to to retire. So my wife and I moved back to Memphis. We have two children here and a and a daughter in Little Rock, with eight grandchildren uh, distributed among them, and so. Uh, moving back to Memphis was the right thing to do, but uh, uh, we've been here now for just over a year, a year and nine days to be specific, and uh, I'm on the staff here at Central Church in, in Memphis. I, I heard in a sermon you said you had eight grandchildren. Is that That's the right. same number still? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, you told me you're, you've been married for about 51 years. That's Is that right. a, That's incredible. Yeah. So. Um, well, I, I think I've uh, heard that you also worked with uh, translators on the Holman Christian Standard right. Bible. Is that? Uh, can you give us just a little bit of in, uh, yeah. introduction to that, or what was that like? I, I have been interested in language all my life, um, virtually, um, and had as a dream that I might become a Bible translator. What what I hoped the Lord would do would, would be to take me to Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, that was not his plan. He took us a different route. But in about 1997, a, a friend of mine who was on the editorial staff at Holman, uh, Rodman Holman Press in Nashville called and asked, said, we're, we're getting ready to make a, do a new translation. We, I wonder if you would be interested in doing some. I said, well, what, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, we're, we're balancing out the translation tasks and he said we have one translator for the book of Psalms and we need two more um, and he gave me two ranges of Psalms that I could translate and I chose uh, Psalms 51, uh, 52 to 101 so uh, I did the basic translation work for the Holman Christian Standard Bible uh, that went through a series of editors and committees and so uh, the, the man who was my editor asked me one day, are you ever going to read your portion of, the, of that translation? I said, no, I'm not. He said, I'm not either. He said, I don't want to see what they did to it. <laughs> but uh, uh, that, that was a, what a is the great privilege. Like exactly? Oh, goodness, that was fascinating. What they asked me to do was uh, five psalms every four months for a period of, I forget how long, uh, three years or so. Um, and so as I began, I've, I've been working on Psalms all my professional life. My dissertation was on Psalms and so I've been fascinated with Psalms. Um, 
uh, I began by reading 26 translations on each psalm. <laughs> Uh, uh, not, not 26 translations, 26 commentaries on each psalm to see where the problems were. And I, I found that as I read the Bible, I was pre-solving all the problems. I hadn't, hadn't paid attention to where the actual problems were in the text. Um, so that alerted me to those things. Over time, I discovered that there was one commentary that pretty much co covered everything. So I, I, over time, well, I don't need to read this commentary anymore. I don't need to read that one. Um, well, what is the commentary? It's um, Marvin Tate, uh, the second volume of the Word Bible co Commentary. It is just fantastic. He, he does what any commentator ought to do. Um, so he identified the problems, gave a summary of the various views, how to solve the problems. And there are all kinds of problems. Uh, Hebrew um, tenses don't refer to time. So you have to discover from the text, from the, from the context, what the time reference is. And they can be, uh, what we would call a finite verb can be an, uh, a, 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 a command or a statement of fact or a wish. <laughs> uh, and so you have to infer all these things from the text, and so you, you can see how there would be lots of different ways of going in looking at a psalm, and unless you understand what the psalm is doing, then you're not really prepared to do that. So um, uh, once I'd worked that out, I, I gave them my translations annotated with footnotes saying here are the options here, and uh, here's, here's who supports this and who supports that send that to the editor and then, then they started making revisions and so forth from that point on. <clears throat> so did you actually present the, the text or are you saying just options for the text? I'm just No, I, I gave them my translated text okay, sure. and uh, they, then they did, did with it as they pleased. I see. <laughs> when you would uh, work on that portion of scripture, what um, text were you translating from? Uh, the Masoretic the text. Yeah, this this is the latest edition of it. Um, there is a new edition coming out. Uh, it's called Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. It's uh, published in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, the the uh, Bible um, Association of Germany does it, and it's based on the the Leningrad Codex, which is about 10th century BC A A D. Um, there, there is a there is a better manuscript than the Leningrad. It's called it's called the Ben Asher text. But during World War II, a substantial portion of it was lost and and has never been recovered. So that was the books of Moses were all lost. Um, so the Leningrad text is our best manuscript. And then you you look at other manuscripts and so on. Uh, there are already the beginnings of thinking about what the text is doing in this text. So from the ninth century on, and in fact, uh, yeah, it was about the ninth century when the Masoretes began putting this kind of material together. They found uh, their tradition of pronunciation differed from the way the text reads, so they're already indicating problems in the text that have to be solved. When uh, translating the Psalms, you, you said you were using this as your basis. Mm -hmm. um, was the Septuagint also considered, or was it yeah. only the Masoretic text? No, I always looked at the Septuagint. That's part of the, that's an ancient Jewish translation. It's actually a, a, a bundle of translations. Um, the Pentateuch was probably translated by either the same author, uh, same translator, or a a group that worked together, but the rest of the books are an amalgam of different things. So in Samuel and Kings, you actually have two different sources of, for the text. And, and uh, so the, the, the Septuagint is just a, is a mess, but um, every translation does a little bit of commentary 
Uh, so you get an idea of what Jews in the first and second centuries BC were thinking about, and even some portions of it go back to the third century BC. So you get an idea of what, number one, what they were thinking about the text, number two, how they would represent the Hebrew in Greek, number three, um, what the Hebrew was that was behind this, uh, the, the Septuagint. So, it's, <clears throat> so in order to work on this, you're relying on some Hebrew, you're relying on Greek. What, what I guess, uh, experience do you have as far as like understanding Hebrew? Like how did you learn Hebrew? How oh goodness, you... yeah. Um, in uh, the summer of 1974, uh, I took beginning Hebrew two semesters uh, with the man who was probably um, at that time probably the finest Hebrew teacher. If, if you wanted to be, begin studying Hebrew, he was the finest at the seminary. You, you couldn't do better. His name was Alan Ross. Uh, I think he's at Beeson uh, Seminary in, is that in Alabama or Georgia? I can't remember now. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I've, I've loved language. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a language nerd. I had eight years of Latin, eight years of Greek, and seven years of Hebrew, uh, and then a smattering of other languages along the way. But um, uh, I had I went to Dallas to major in Greek and in New Testament. But then when I got into Hebrew, I fell in love with it so much that I thought, now number one, if I'm going to have a strength, I grew up in church. You know about attendance pins? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I probably, when I was three months old, would have had a, a year attendance pin. <laughs> so so uh, I grew up in church, and I thought, if I'm going to have a strength, it's going to be a New Testament, not an old, so I need to work on my, my weakness rather than my strength. So I went to Hebrew. Uh, loved it. Loved every minute of it. Now, when it comes to the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, you, you, you mentioned the idea that there's problems, you know, with some of the the texts or that you're reading comments. Yeah, you got interpretational problems. problems. Yeah. How would you differentiate the Holman Christian Standard Bible from other English versions that are out there? It's comparable to most of the modern translations. Um, the uh, um, I, I don't know how to how to characterize it. How about how about the the underlying source document? Okay. So, like when it's, we talk about you use this yes. particular um, Masoretic Hebrew and you've used the Septuagint, yeah. what would you say from a process perspective? Is is everybody kind of using the same? Everybody since William Tyndale and uh, and uh, Wycliffe have been using this text. If they're working on the Old Testament, they're working with this. And when it comes to the Masoretic text um, for Hebrew, would you say that um, it's possible for us to reconstruct the Hebrew text from extant manuscripts, or, or would you say we kind of just take it by faith? No, there are there are manuscripts available. Uh, the the interesting thing is, and, and this is a unique e example, when the when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Um, one of them was the, the massive Isaiah scroll. And if you go to Israel today, you go to the, I think it's at the Israeli Museum. Um, uh, the, the, there is the Shrine of the Book. And they have a, a, a facsimile of the Isaiah scroll on a massive cylinder all the way around, sort of circular room. You can walk around, you can read. If you, if you know the script of ancient Hebrew, you can read it. And it is essentially the same as this text has for Isaiah after, uh, and the, the Isaiah scroll I think dates to the second century BC. Um, it's essentially same as this text that's based on a text from the, from the 10th century. So 1200 years, it's essentially the same. What is different is the way they represent vowels. Uh, Hebrew has no vowels in it. Ancient Hebrew has no vowels. So as time 
progressed. They started representing vowels, re repurposing consonants in their voca in their alphabet, as we have done with Y. Y is both a, 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 a vowel and a consonant, uh, and and so they're indicating uh, different. Uh, in some places, they're indicating the vowels that should be there. So, um, so when that's already present in the, in the uh, Great Isaiah Scroll. So when you're uh, using the ancient Hebrew, uh, you kind of talked about the vowels. Are you using the uh, vowel markings mm -hmm. that were uh, present, or are, you, are the vowels somewhat uh, open to interpretation? No, the vowels are pretty clear. Uh, the Masoretes, the, the Masoretic text, uh, the word Masora in Hebrew means um, a hedge. They, if you look at this, this has um, uh, writing. Here's the text, but in the in the col in the in the margins, there are there are indications of notes and things. The, this very small print here, this is the mas the, the the small Masora. Uh, and in this, they are telling you about uh, frequency of words and uh, odd words and places where the pronunciation differs uh, from, the, from the, the order of the consonants. consonants. So, um, but in the text itself, with the letters, there are all kinds of little marks. They're called vowel points. And they are very, very helpful. Um, I can read some passages without the vowel points now, but most of the of the book I'd have to have the vowel points to read. So, so there's a, a sophisticated system of vowels in the text as it's now given to us. Since you mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and and you kind of mentioned the project in Germany where they're updating potentially the the Masoretic text. Let's say, for example, someone found um, a more ancient or an older uh, manuscript of Hebrew that was different than w what we have in this Masoretic. Would you give, uh, my, my question would be like, do you, would you give credence to that as to maybe we should update the text or would you say we should stick with what we've already been given? Um, our problem is we don't have a, a good handle on all the manuscripts and what's there. Uh, our New Testament manu uh, 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 Greek text is much better at this kind of issue than the Hebrew text is. The next one, um, Biblia Hebraica Hebrew Bible Quinta, number five, uh, is coming out, and each of the fascicles is like $90, so I'm not buying them. <laughs> but but uh, uh, that's going to be fuller, but it's, it's still not going to be full enough. Uh, even in our text as we have it, there are places where different manuscripts vary. The very few manuscripts that we do have, they vary, and so we have to ask the question, well, which one is more likely to be original? And, and so you do have to make that decision. Right, So, but if we did find more yeah. information, you would use that to potentially... Yeah, we'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to see what it would do, uh, what is the, how good is the manuscript, how well is it written, um, uh, how careful were the scribes that put it together, and and then look at the text and say, well, here here's an odd reading. Does this solve a problem for us? Um, and so uh, I'd be willing to say, as as here, this this section at the bottom of the is is the text critical apparatus for each page, and it's actually bringing in evidence from Qumran for our text. And so Qumran preserves some earlier readings that this 10th century manuscript didn't have. One interesting one uh, is uh, in, in Deuteronomy 32. Um, there's a, if, if you were reading in Hebrews chapter 1, you have the line, let all the angels of God praise him. Uh, and your, your Bible may have a cross-reference to Deuteronomy 32. You won't find it in your Bible. 
It's not in the Masoretic text, but it is in the Qumran scroll of Deuteronomy. <laughs> so we're able to restore some things that, that the New Testament treated as Old Testament quotations, but we can't identify them. So, so we're able to, to correct that in that regard. So if we found more ancient evidence, would that be added in, in your opinion? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, probably, it wouldn't change much, but it would change some. What about when it comes to just in general the idea of, of God's Word being preserved? You know, and, and most churches would say we believe the Word of God is perfect and errant and, yeah. um, and you know, is delivered to man through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is your general idea of, as far as the Word of God being preserved? What do you believe about that? Uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I believe that God did preserve His Word. A, a, a clear evidence of this, and I, I suppose most of your folks will be, a pre, a, be available or have this information available, we have something like 6,000 Greek manuscripts. Many of them are very late, uh, 15th century, 14th century, uh, but several hundred are from within 200 years or 300 years of the writing of the New Testament. No other ancient Greek, ancient Greek or Latin work has that same kind of pedigree. They're all 1,000 years later. Uh, 800 years later. So we have a remarkable um, fund of information about our New Testament and Old Testament texts. Um, and frankly, the differences are not substantial. Uh, most of the differences, I uh, was looking at an article yesterday, uh, if, if, if you wanted to translate the phrase or the sentence, Jesus loves Paul, into Greek, into New Testament Greek. There are 11 different ways to do it. <laughs> so are those 11 differences in the text or are they simply saying the same thing? You see what I'm saying? Sure. So uh, that's incomprehensible to us in English, but you can have the definite article with proper names and you can have them in different orders and so on. Uh, so 11 different ways of saying that. Uh, so are those 11 differences in the text, or are they just saying the same thing and they're not really differences, they're just word order? That's most of what we have. I was looking at um, the, uh, what, what is that here? Um, oy vey. Okay. I was looking at a series of, uh, of, uh, of translations on, on my screen here, if, if, you can, if this is useful to you. Uh, at the top, this is the Textus Receptus from 1555. Uh, so this would be about the time of, um, uh, certainly before the King James was translated. It's the time when Luther was, it's after actually Luther was translating his text, but um, here's the Scrivener of 1881, basically the same text. The difference between these two is that this one does not have breathing marks at the beginnings. Every vowel that begins a word in Greek has to have a breathing mark, either smooth or rough breathing. And then every word has some accent. The, the 1555 text doesn't indica indicate accents or breathing marks. The 1881 does. Okay, uh, so far so good? Yeah. Uh, this is the majority text that was published by another one of our prof uh, professors, uh, Zane Hodges, um, which is fundamentally uh, similar to Scrivener. And then this is the one that I have here. This is the Nestle Allen text. 20, edition 28, uh, and this, this tool that I have on the screen <laughs> indicates differences between the, the different verses, and for this verse, I, I didn't, 
pick anything except just at random. Um, for this verse, which is uh, Luke 135, there are no, there's a 4% difference between uh, the TR, the, St the Stephanus version of the New Testament, and the Scrivener. There is no difference between the majority text and the NA28. Uh, and as you go down the text, here is one, here's one that's kind of interesting, verse 36. And behold, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, uh, she herself has conceived a son uh, in her old age. And this one, is she is in the sixth month for her who was called barren. Uh, so this is, uh, you have the same translation, uh, even with the differences. Th here, though, the NA28, the, the newest edition that we have, has a 14% difference from the from the uh, 1555 Greek text. But the only fundamental differences are spelling of the word kinswoman, and the word conceived is a participle here, and it's a, it's a finite verb there. Uh, so most of the differences are like that. And as I was looking through this, in fact, I started reading a majority text, New Testament, um, several years ago. I, I read through the New Testament not yearly, but nearly every year in Greek. And um, uh, I was looking for differences, and I couldn't see them. And basically what they've done, uh, our word a, a house, a car, we put an N when, we, when it's followed by a vowel sound, um, an hour. Um, Greek does that with words that end in I or E. <laughs> uh, the Textus Receptus leaves them out. Scrivener and the rest put them in, including the majority text, put them in. <laughs> so, so most of the differences. Um, we have this fellow Bart Ehrman who's running around our day, <laughs> in our day. Uh, there are 150,000, there are 500,000 variants in the New Testament. Most of them are like that. They, they have no consequence to the meaning of the text at all. Uh, word order may have some significance, but Greek word order is not as tight as English. And so it's much more fluid and can, the words can f float around the, the, the sentence. Doesn't change the translation or the meaning. When it comes to, uh, you brought up the Texas Receptus, yeah. the majority text, yeah. and um, I guess what some would label the modern critical text mm -hmm. with the Nestle Elan. I think mm -hmm. it showed it was a, the 28th edition, I think, mm -hmm. on the screen there. What, what is your just kind of uh, viewpoint as far as the differences between those, however? You know, you said they're kind of trivial, but what, what, why is there a Nestle Elan versus yeah. the received text? Uh, one of the reasons is we have so much. We, we, we just have an embarrassment of riches of New Testament manuscripts. Uh, the the uh, uh, Bibelgesellschaft uh, Stuttgart and um, also in Tübingen, these are not good names in, in theology, but they're good names in church in, in uh, uh, the history of the text. They are cataloging all the manuscripts that are found. One of our professors at Dallas is actually out searching for new, new manuscripts that nobody's found before. And he's finding, uh, I forget how many they said they have found in the last 10 years, 100 manuscripts that nobody has ever studied. In fact, they're in libraries where the library didn't even know what the text was. And so, so he's bringing them in, digitizing all the manuscripts he can get his hands on so that s some of these are falling apart with age. So um, this will be a fund to be able to say, you know, Bart Ehrman is, is out to lunch. He's just simply wrong. Yes, there are 500 variants in the text, but 500,000 variants in the text, but it's spelling it E-I instead of I for long I, you know? Sure. So, so what's the point? Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't affect the meaning whatsoever. But we want to get as close to what the original authors wrote as we can. Um, in First Peter 1, uh, 
men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. First uh, Corinthians two, uh, which things we speak in words taught not by human wisdom, but by the word by the the Spirit of God. Uh, the, the word that's translated there uh, sometimes um, it's sometimes comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. I looked at that word again this morning just to make sure I knew what I was talking about. It's used 12 times in the Septuagint. Um, people don't realize this, but the Septuagint was the King James for the first century. <laughs> so uh, if you were a Christian and if, if you had access to a Bible, it was probably going to be a King, a, a, the Septuagint. So the language, the, theology, the theological language of the New Testament is derived from the Septuagint. So I need to study the Septuagint. If I'm a New Testament student, I've got to do that. Um, the word is used 12 times in the Septuagint. Nine times it's used not to mean compare. Um, eight of the nine times it's specifically referring to how do you interpret visions. So in Genesis it's used several times. In Daniel it's used once. Um, in Numbers, it's used in a case where the man is picking up sticks on the Sabbath, and they they don't know what to do, so they they uh, so they are waiting for the Lord to give them the interpretation, and so uh, that's that's the word there. They they wanted to discern what to do with him. Um, so First Corinthians one uh, uh, says even the words are inspired. So I want to know what the words are. I, I don't want the word of man. I want the word of God. So I want to do everything I can to, to be able to say, this is pretty close to what Paul wrote. So you said you wanted to look it up in Greek. Yeah. When, when you're looking uh, a passage up in Greek, would, do you actually look at all four of the examples you showed us on the screen, or do you actually prefer one? Do you, which is the most reliable I, Greek? Well, I don't know. I, I default to the NA-28. Just because uh, it's it's the most up to date, but uh, you're always looking at the manuscript tradition to see what they're doing, and with so many manuscripts, the word of God is preserved. There's no question about it. We we're, we're dealing with with um, often we're dealing with very minute issues and nothing major. There there's some big ones, of course, as as you're aware. Maybe we'll need to talk about those later, but um, for the most part, the Greek texts that we have in our English Bibles are quite reliable, and they are they're doing um, a great job in in helping us understand what God is saying. So the Texas Receptus is uh, used for many of the initial English translations, such as you know the Tyndale, the Geneva, the Bishops, and the King James. When the King James comes on the scene, it pretty much displaces all other English versions for several hundred years. Um, why, why do you think that we needed to change that, or why, why, did the Engli you know, why did we change from a King James Bible to the cornucopia of English versions? What's your... I, I brought here today a 1611 version of the, of the uh, King James, and it's understandable mostly, but it had to be updated, and it's been updated a couple of times prior to the 19th century, or to the 20th century. Um, so when you say updated, what do you mean by that? <laughs> words don't mean today what they meant 500 years ago. Um, if I were to call your wife a nice hussy in, in 1611, she would slap me because I called her nice because hussy was actually a compliment. <laughs> it meant housewife and a good one. Nice meant simple-minded. <laughs> so if, if, if I have language 500 years old, I may not understand what's going on. Um, a verse that I learned, as many of us did in Second in First Thessalonians, uh, we who are alive and remain shall, uh, to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent those who, who are, have fallen asleep. Well, prevent doesn't mean what it meant in 1611. Prevent, they, 
the, the translators actually invented Greek word, English words out of either Latin or Greek. Um, so baptize was a, uh, a solution to the problem because they had, they had immersionists and they had sprinklers. So how are you going to translate this word baptizo? So they, they, all they did was just um, transliterate it into English. The word that is translated in First Thessalonians, um, prevent, means go before. We will not go before. So this version would not communicate well, in the, not, even in the 19th century. So it was updated then. Uh, so uh, we, we need the updating because language changes. And that's the problem that we face continually. Now, in the 19th century, we have uh, men like Westcott and Hort yes. who are giving us an updated Greek text. <clears throat> it's, it appears, you know, when studying a lot of the modern versions, they're relying more on the Westcott and Hort Greek text over maybe the received, yeah. received text. What is your no, opinion? that wouldn't be the case. Um, the, the spate of translation that has occurred since the 1950s. Uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the RSV was considered terrible. So uh, we, we had a way of, of dealing with that at, at Dallas Seminary. My hope is built on nothing less than Schofield Notes and Scripture Press. I dare not trust the RSV and the ASV is heresy. <laughs> but. Um, um, the spate of translations, ESV, the NIV, the NASV, the uh, can't NLT, uh, can't think um, beyond that, um, has come, for example, the, the Holman was, was printed, was done, because the Southern Baptist Convention was using the NIV in their Sunday school literature, but they, they wanted to adjust things in the text that they put in their Sunday school literature from the NIV and the publishers wouldn't allow them to do that. They wanted to, uh, in, in other words, they didn't want to have to explain away something in Sunday school that was not consistent with their doctrine and so they wanted a, a, their own translation. Thus the Holman has come out. Uh, so it's kind of a influence from the Southern Baptist Convention. That, but uh, yeah, the Holman is uh, certainly, but the NIV and the, and the uh, ESV and so on are um, attempts to serve people who are not happy with other translations. <laughs> but also to bring it up into modern language. Um, when when I was a young man, I was a youth director in a church in Killeen, Texas. My wife was speaking in a Sunday school class at our church, a bunch of kids in the class. And she's, she's real bubbly and real vivacious. She said, now kids, what's Jesus like? This was our first experience in an ethnically diverse setting. So we had Korean kids and we had um, uh, uh, Anglo kids and we had Hispanics and we had African Americans. It, it, was, it was marvelous of my first experience with that. So she said, what's Jesus like? And one kid in the back said, man, he was bad. <laughs> she said, no, he wasn't. But bad had changed for that generation. It meant fantastic. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, if, I, if I leave even Ten years, if I leave a translation alone and don't change it in just ten years, the language can change and, I'll, and we'll be miscommunicating to people that we want to reach. What about uh, differences from the received text and the critical text where it's not simply saying the same thing in a different word order or well, there are spellings, but simply does actually yeah. say something different? What would you... Would you say that you rely more on the, the critical text or the received? More the, uh, the critical text. Uh, the received text was uh, derived from uh, Erasmus's text. <laughs> Erasmus didn't even have the whole New Testament in Greek that he translated from. Uh, so he didn't have portions of Revelation, so he translated it back from Latin into Greek. Um, um, 
the and and um, I, I I've been reading a, a, a biography of of um, uh, Tyndale uh, recently, and he he talked about one of the translations that was made from uh, uh, from uh, Erasmus's Greek text, and it it really caused some problems. They 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 had to they had to do a lot more study. So um, the uh, received text, you, you are aware that the term received text was from the publisher. It wasn't something the church did. It, it was the publisher, Stephanus. This is now the text received, textus receptus in Latin, uh, the, the, the text received among all the churches. But uh, that was the publisher <laughs> doing that. That was trying to sell books. So it, it, the received text is not really the received text. It's just an, an early Greek manuscript or, or Greek uh, text. So you've got to, you've got to think, okay, um, what are we going to do with this? Now, um, because we ha we're using much more information. Uh, we're getting manuscript evidence. And there are places where, when, when, when you come up with different variants in the, te in the manuscripts, the question always is, what are, number one, what, is, what are scribes likely to do? And number two, which of the variants can explain the rest? If I can explain the rest based on one, that's got to be the original one. Um, Scribes are much more likely to add to the text, not to detract from it. Um, scribes are likely to uh, write, especially <laughs> a, a tired scribe is going to sometimes change a text because of memory. He's not paying attention to his manuscript carefully. Uh, so you get differences in the text. Um, the, but, but when I look at, here is, here is the, RS, the received text. I had another one years ago, but I got this primarily to take to graduation at seminary so I could carry it in my, in my gown. <laughs> but but um, um, when I read this, when I read, this is the Vaticanus text, and it's very hard to read. It's all in capital letters with no spaces between words. When I read this one, this is the newest Greek, trans, uh, Greek text that's come out. Uh, the Tyndale House uh, edition. I read a good part of it. This takes us back to the earliest uh, accessible Greek uh, form of the Greek text that we can get uh, from the manuscripts. And when I read this, and I'm, I will finish reading this uh, in the next couple of days, uh, by December 31st, I'll finish the second reading this year. I don't see differences. There are places, but most of the differences don't make differences. So, thinking of just an example, um, you know, like First John chapter five verse seven. Yes, and that's one of the crucial ones. Um, what would be your uh, thoughts as far as that? that passage of scripture. Well, perhaps you know the history of it. Uh, when when uh, Erasmus in the 16th century was putting together his New Testament, his New Testament didn't have that line. Uh, he, he didn't have many manuscripts, um, so he didn't include it. And the church got really upset with him. Erasmus was a peacemaker. He, he, he agreed in a lot of ways with Luther theologically, but he was not going to go to the extent that Luther went. Um, so the church came back and said, you've got to put that in your, in your Bible. We, it's a crucial text for the, for the Trinity. He said, if you can show me one Greek manuscript that has it, I'll do it in my next edition. Well, if you look in my, in my text here, this, this one, this is the critical text. Uh, let's turn to that. Um, it, it's, a, it's an odd thing that goes on here. Um, chapter 5, I don't remember the verse. I remember chapters, I don't remember verses well. Um, 
Uh, it's in verse uh, 7. When I look at the text down here, uh, I read, In terra spiritus et aqua et sanguis. Um, and then a lot of a lot of differences. At at tres sunt qui testimonium decunt in Kylo. There are three who give testimony in, who speak testimony in heaven: Pater, Verbum, Orphelius. In some manuscripts, at Spiritus. And of course, this is Latin. But when I look at the Greek manuscripts, um, the, m most of the most of the evidence is in the margin. Not in the text itself. There's one or two that have it in the text itself. So that's not even a majority text. See, that, that, that's simply not even original. Um, but I don't need that in order to establish the, de the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity. I have so much more information. I don't need that verse. Th this, is, this is kind of an interesting historical. What about, <clears throat> so like an NIV... Um versus uh, like a King James Bible may have like 16 whole verses not included. Um, some would even suggest that the ending of Mark 16 uh, is not uh, authoritative or there's clout about yeah. its authenticity. What, what is your viewpoint when people are, you know, questioning? These are the, passages. yeah, that passage in John 5 are the, are the big ones that are problematic to us. Um, Mark 16, I, my, my wife, even after all the years she sat under my teaching, said, do you mean to tell me that part of the Bible is not the Bible? Uh, so let's go to Mark 16 and, and think about this a few minutes. Um, there are a number of different ways that Mark ends in the various manuscripts. Um, my text has, after verse 8, um, uh, all things that were commanded to them by uh, uh, who are around Peter, uh, they announced uh, uh, carefully. After these things, Jesus himself, from the east to the west, sent them out, uh, sent, sent out through them the holy and incorruptible proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. That's, that's right after verse 8 in, in this text. Following that is verse 9, arising on the first day of the end. So you have verses 9 to 16. Um, this is the big one that everybody wonders about. Um, so, so let's uh, apply our two questions. Uh, what are scribes likely to do? Are they likely to omit or are they likely to include uh, stuff that is not in their manuscript? much more likely to add than they are to subtract. The scribes, I, I was listening to a lecture some while ago by a, a major New Testament scholar, and he said, uh, even the papyri, and I, I have one here, this is P46. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a manuscript on papyrus. This is just a picture of it. I, I, nobody would allow me to buy that page, <laughs> but... but uh, uh, he said, uh, this was discovered in Egypt. Um, it includes Hebrews 9, 10 to 16. It's very carefully written, very skillfully written. Um, the scribes were very careful, but there were lapses that people have. Everybody has, has experienced in copying things out of a book. Uh, by the way, that, that manuscript is about the size of this notebook. It's about 6 by 10 inches and 86 pages. This one has about 100 in it. That, that looks like kind of just a fragment, right? Like that's not necessarily like a whole book. No, this is a page from that book. But, okay. but the book has 86 pages in it. Okay. And it, it includes a great part of Romans. All of, of Hebrews comes right after Romans, which is interesting. And 1 Corinthians, all of 1 Corinthians is there. So it has a substantial part of the Pauline epistles. Now, when it comes to uh, Greek, obviously there's a lot of contention as far as some of the manuscript evidence or what's existent. What about, if we think about Hebrew, going back to Hebrew for a second, yeah. um, does the Septuagint 
uh, have complete uh, books of, of the oh, Old yeah. Testament? Yeah. What would be some of the completed books? Of All the of them. All of them. Yeah. Uh, the problem, though, is that our print, printed Greek New Testament, Greek Old Testament, is uh, derived from separate manuscripts. You've got to remember that in the ancient world, most books were written on scrolls. And a scroll can, I forget the, the maximum length that a scroll is useful. 40 feet's in my mind, but don't hold me to that. It might be a little longer. Um, but by the way, this would only be 10 inches. This is a little bit larger than that. Uh, so here's the, here's the notebook. It's pretty close, but that's about right. Um, um, this was on a, a codex. This is a codex. Christians used the codex for their manuscripts, but the Septuagint's a Jewish work, and so they were writing on scrolls. So when you have scrolls, by and large, you're not going to have um, uh, 39 books <laughs> in one scroll. You can't. It couldn't be read. You couldn't write it. Um, so you're going to have multiple scrolls, and Scrolls go, get old, they get torn, and so somebody uh, 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 finds another scroll and patches them together, but the one scroll is translated by somebody, uh, one guy, and the other scroll is translated by somebody else, so the translation techniques are different. Do you follow? Sure. So uh, the Septuagint's a patchwork of lots of different manuscripts. The biggest problem we have in the Old Testament is the length of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah in the Septuagint is about 20%, is about 80% uh, uh, of the length of the Hebrew Old Testament, Jeremiah. There's even the possi uh, probability uh, when, when you write a letter in the first century, uh, especially if it's an important letter, you dictate it and a scribe copies it out then writes it out and you, and you read what the scribe wrote and you say yeah you know I, I really want to change this so they write a different edition to send maybe to the actual recipient so you have two originals which are not identical but with only minor changes does that make sense to you so you've got all these problems at work that means we've got some work to do to make sure that we have the, the wording that we can get as close as we can to the authors of the New Testament. Would you say that the Septuagint can correct the Masoretic Hebrew in places? It can. Uh, as I read the Septuagint, I, I read through the Septuagint a year ago. Um, first time I've ever done that. Uh, but uh, reading through it, I thought, um, I know this text well enough to know they didn't really understand it. <laughs> they didn't get the Hebrew. What about the Dead Sea Scrolls? At times. Sure. Yeah. The Dead Sea Scrolls, would you say that that can also potentially correct the Hebrew? It can. Um, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually has that line that's quoted in Hebrews 1 in Deuteronomy 32. So uh, uh, there are places where we know that the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a better text than the Masoretic text does. When we think about English and we think about the translations that exist, what would be your recommendation as far as just the most accurate oh, gosh. English version? Not, none of them, all of them, and none of them. Uh, um, a translation is a very short commentary. <laughs> uh, so if I wanted to just know, you, you mentioned this earlier, you said, I want to know exactly what God said. I want to right? get as close as I can to sure. it. Yeah. If, if I want to get as close or I want to know exactly yeah. what he said, what would be the vehicle by which yeah. I would get there? You know, there are some remarkable tools out today. Um, one is you can trust your translation. You can trust it. It was... The, the process goes through multiple com com committees with people, uh, the Holman, for example, although it was, it was sponsored by the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention, was actually the translators were from all kinds of different backgrounds. 
And the committees included people from different theological backgrounds uh, so that there is not a peculiarly Southern Baptist flavor to that book. Try to remove bias and things like that. That's right. So um, these, these translations that are done by committee are really the way to go. That's what the King James was. It was a translation done by committee. Uh, and it's wise. No one man knows enough about the Bible to translate the whole thing. Um, so we ought to have committees, people who, who are committed to the Lord, committed to the inerrancy of Scripture, committed to the Word of God, doing this work, and that's what we're getting. Do you believe um, that a translation can still maintain the inspiration of the... Absolutely. Episode? What would you say is your view as far as the inspiration of a... Tra like from a translation perspective, like an English Bible? Well, it's... Uh, for every use you want to put it to, it is the Word of God. Now, I was thinking about a particular example in John chapter number 3, um, verse 36. The, uh, the Bible in uh, a King James Version would say, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, I'm not familiar with necessarily every modern version, but I know the ESV in the second portion of this verse would say, he that does not obey the Son. Yeah. The, prob the problem is the word that's translated obey or, or unbelieve, disbelieve, can mean either word. Um, this, this is where the tools come in very handy. Um, I have, in the last seven years or so, become more adept <laughs> at using a software called Logos Bible Software. And it will allow even a person who's not studied Greek to be able to get to this kind of information and see, okay, this word can mean different things in different places. Um, so if you were particularly interested in that, then that would be the issue. Within the context, and, and that's always the issue. A word means what it means in context. Now, let me give you an example of this. Turn over to Romans chapter, uh, oh, what chapter? Uh, three. Um, this, this is 318. Uh, it's not 18 either. It's, uh, yeah, 319 is what I want. Um, uh, 319, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now, I'm, a, I'm an American, I'm a Christian, I've grown up in church, law, that's Moses, right? The law is Moses. Yeah, it's definitely referred to as, as, the, as uh, the law in several places. Um, yeah, lots of times. Uh, so even in the Old Testament, it's referred to as law. So when I look at verse 10, um, I, see, I, I, I tease my classes. You see, I have a doctorate from Dallas Seminary, and I know great and wise things most people don't know. And verse 19 follows verse 18. <laughs> That's what I know. That's what I learned getting a doctorate in Dallas. Uh, verses 10 to 18, uh, Paul is now summarizing the point in verses 19 and 20. He calls that law, but there's not a single quotation from Moses in that list, 10 to 18. There's Psalms and and, and, and uh, Proverbs and Isaiah, but not a single quotation from Moses. Here is a place where law must mean Old Testament. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So you're always asking, a word can have various senses. It doesn't have all of the same sen all of the senses in every place where it occurs. In fact, it doesn't have all of the senses in any place where it occurs. It has one or more, but never all. So when I'm in John 3.36 and I see that word, it can be translated. It is legitimately translated elsewhere to be disobedient. Uh, but within the context of John, the point is more uh, unbelief than it is being disobedient. So you always ask, what does the context do to the meaning of a word? Now, if I By the way, 
By the way, looking at various translations, you can see where the where the uh, the interpretive problems are, and then you can go start to work. Okay, now I've got a problem here. I got to figure out what this text is really trying to say. I'm sorry to interrupt no, you. Fine. If I want to better understand the text, yes. would you say I, I need to understand Greek to get the the best understanding? No. Uh, Greek is necessary for people who really want to be Bible teachers, uh, who, who, for whom that's the primary commitment of their lives. Um, so. Would you say there's more understanding from the Greek potentially, or? Uh, it it can clear up some issues, but, but we have resources now like Logos Bible software. And I, I have no stock in, in Logos, I'm not trying to sell anything here, but Logos Bible software actually gives you access to that kind of information. You don't need to learn Greek to do it. I'm, I'm planning to, to propose where we're, the church where we're meeting today is, uh, is the present pastor says it's kind of like a new church plant. Um, uh, so they're, they're experimenting with different, different things to do. One of the things I want to do is offer a course to people on how to how to understand basics basic issues of Greek and Hebrew so that you can make sense out of what the commentaries are saying and so that you can use a, a software like Logos Bible software so someone becomes a Christian yeah. and you want them to read the Bible what Bible are you going to put in their hand give them one they will read if it's the New Living Translation let them read that if it's the New International Readers version readers um, version, let them read that. Uh, if it's the Living Bible, let them read that. Um, eventually, I'm going to have to, I want to, uh, to graduate them to a little more advanced level of reading. But there are people who just never will. Um, what would be the, just again, you know, I, I, if I want to know what's probably the best English version, do you have an opinion <laughs> on that? It's the one that you will read. Okay. What about, um, <clears throat> when it comes to study, like you know, like a pastor or someone that's in, in ministry, um, sh should they give credence to a particular version over another? No. What about like the message? You know, it's been. I have. I don't think I've ever even read the thing. Um, I don't know. I have no exposure to it, so I, I can't comment on it. Would you say it's possible that an English version? Uh, could stray too much from the text to yeah. where it's actually inaccurate. Yeah, that's that that happens, and there are places in all of the my favorite Bibles that 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 does happen. Um, the NIV, I think, goes significantly astray in Romans seven. It talks about sin nature, and that's not that's not the text; it's the flesh. So we've got to define what flesh is, and not give a definition. There's a place in Proverbs. What? Where is that in Proverbs? Um, Twenty-six, maybe. It it almost got Proverbs kicked out of the Old Testament. The rabbis were worried about this this passage. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he lest he be wise in his own eyes. The very next verse says, "Do not answer a fool according to his folly, uh, lest you become like him." The NIV solved the problem, but Proverbs, the whole point of Proverbs is to create problems of understanding so that you will be exercised for wisdom and come to wisdom from the various different points of view. Uh, so they, they solved the problem and should not have. They've, they've ruined what Proverbs is trying to accomplish. But those are isolated places. But if you're reading various translations, you'll, you'll, you'll solve that problem. Sure. Now, you, you mentioned that uh, language change over time. Yes. That's undeniable. Yes. Uh, the English language could potentially stabilize a little bit in the sense that we have a lot of uh, international interests and, and you know a lot of people with communication, the, the internet and things like that. You know in some ways language can stabilize in other ways it's gonna change but do you think that there'll ever be a time when we have an English translation where we kind of walk away and say it's it's settled like it, we haven't. Yeah, probably not. Uh, I had 
I, I was in Australia a number of years ago with some friends uh, teaching at a, at a college. We were invited to preach. Each of us was in, invited at different times to preach in a church that, where the college met. Uh, and one of these dear brothers kept using the word stuff in his sermon. And every time he would use it, I would sink lower in the chair because in, in, in Australia, stuff is a really offensive word. <laughs> it's just, yeah. So even though it's an international language and even though it's broadly used, because it's broadly used, um, in, I've been in India 19 times <laughs> on ministry. Uh, even though in India, English is spoken, it's, a, it's not American or even British English. Um, so, no, I don't think that's ever going to happen. In translation work? In any capacity. Oh, well, preachers do it every Sunday. <laughs> uh, Specifically in translation setting. Though. In translation setting, the, you, you got, if you knew more of the translators, you would find that their heart is really sound. They really love the Lord. Their, their, their goal, their heart is not to mislead. It's, it's to help people understand. Uh, a translation that I might work on may not communicate well to the to a community that I'm involved with, so I'll use a different translation. That's okay. I don't have any problem with that. What about like in passages in the book, at the very end of the Bible, like in Revelation, um, chapter number twenty-two? Uh, it gives a pretty strong warning about yes. tampering with God's yes. word. Uh, specifically in the King James, it may say. Uh, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God yes. shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city. Um, it also says in the previous passage, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto the plagues that are written in this book. So that sounds like a pretty strong warning. Yeah. Would you say that people are guilty of this particular passage? I wouldn't. I, no, I wouldn't say that because we're not trying to change the message, and that's what what this is talking about. This is actually a, a text on canonicity more than it is on the specific verbiage of, 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 the word, of the book. Don't change the message. This is essential. You've got to have this message. Um, what about a work like the New World Translation, such oh as like the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, they, are, they are clearly uh, motivated not even by Greek. They, they make the Greek say what they want it to do. So that's an entirely different issue. Would you say that that is a corruption? Yeah, of the certainly. Word of God? Yeah, okay. yeah. But you, you, you see, the, the the people I'm talking about in translation committees are are born again people. The New World Translation is not even by born again people. They deny our our Lord. Would you know? You you mentioned that a lot of times when they're in translating work, they may borrow from various denominations yes. and, and backgrounds yes. and things like that. Would you say that all of these people actually agree on doctrines like salvation? Uh, most of them, yes. Okay. Yeah. So would you say that most of them believe salvation is by faith? Or, okay. What about someone who doesn't believe that? Would they still be accepted to work on the committee? Uh, I had to sign a doctrinal statement when I did the uh, Holman, and I, uh, Dallas Seminary has a really sound doctrinal statement on these issues, and I assume that all of the others who were involved in the Holman were in that same boat. But, I, but I've met um, the guy who is the, the uh, I don't even know what they call him, he's, he's the director for the whole NIV project now. and. And he is solidly evangelical. Uh, they're not going to let people into that who aren't. The ESV uh, translation committee and the the editorial committee 
were, were the same thing, just really, really rock solid evangelicals. Would you say that any of the modern versions of the Bible are relying solely on the received text, or are they all relying on? I don't know. Uh, the New King James, uh, the New King James is is based on the received text, but that's only for the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? What well, it's the it's the same thing that every other translation uses the Masoretic text. Okay. What about this is an interesting question? Do you think Jesus? either read from or would have used the Septuagint? Uh, he, uh, in, in John 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he makes a statement, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the Greek word, I'm sorry to do that, but I, I can't do it in English and get the sense. You must be born anothen. Um, Greek and Hebrew scholars, uh, uh, and Aramaic scholars all say there is no language but Greek that will allow the misunderstanding that Nicodemus has in that text. So he must have been speaking Greek. Did he read, did he read the Septuagint? I don't know. Probably he was raised with the Hebrew text. Um, but, but the Hebrew of the first century uh, was not entirely intelligible to the average Aramaic speaker. So he, his, the language that he learned as a baby was probably not Hebrew, but Aramaic. Uh, I, I'm fairly confident that he spoke uh, Hebrew. He may have spoken a little Latin. He, his, he and his, his uh, earthly father probably did some work in a town just north of Nazareth whose name now escapes me. It's just been recently ex excavated. But it was, it was in, in construction when Jesus was growing up. So they probably, it was just a few miles north, so they probably got work up there. That would entail, it was a Roman city, so th th that would entail probably speaking a little Latin and probably grew up speaking Greek too. Um, so I don't know what kind of reading materials he would have had available to him in, the, in this in the synagogue, it would have been a Hebrew text. Okay. So when he goes into the temple and reads Isaiah, you believe that was Hebrew? Yeah. Okay. What about a particular passage, and, and this is kind of more of a stylistic question, but in Matthew 25, verse 23, uh, this is a verse that I think a lot of people probably have memorized, but it says, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, but what's interesting, and I'm not from, uh, an expert with the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> I believe that it actually says, well done, good and faithful slave. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think about the difference between those two from a, like a stylistic yeah. pers perspective? The, the, the Greek word doulos really does mean slave. And so servant is the way we've cleaned it up in English <laughs> to make it palatable. Um, when Paul calls himself... Uh, a, a servant of Jesus Christ. It's doulos. It's that same word. So, uh, and indeed, when Paul talks in Romans six about freedom, he defines it in terms of slavery. If you're if you're if you're enslaved to righteousness, you're freed from sin. If you're if you're um, uh, enslaved to sin, you're free from righteousness. The only freedom is slavery. Um, and so, um, it, the word is slave. That's the right word. What about another stylistic question? Um, in the book of Psalms, uh, like chapters 9, and, and there's definitely other places um, where a King James Bible may use the word hell. Yeah. In other versions, yeah. it may use the word sheol. sheol. I, yeah, that's a, that's a less important issue. The, uh, it's... it's um, Sheol is the Hebrew word, uh, sometimes Abaddon, sometimes the pit, um, but there it's probably Sheol in Hebrew. Hell was an, a kind of cover, a, a, a uh, blanket coverall word <laughs> for, uh, for, the, for that reality uh, for which Hebrew had several different expressions. 
so there are places where it means simply the grave. There are, some, there are places where Sheol means the, the abode of the dead, where they are, where they are tormented, where, it's, where life is hopeless. Uh, so, so in a sense, hell is, is placing all of our New Testament Christian concept on that one term where it has many different concepts in the Old Testament. What about the same word uh, as far as, you know, an English version, like saying hell, like in Acts chapter 2, yeah. well, verse 31, uh, it says it. Hades, I believe, yeah. In, yeah. in Acts. What would you say Hades is? It's, it's, would you say Hades and hell are equivalent? Roughly. Um, in Roman thought, when you die, you go to Hades. In Roman and Greek thought, uh, you die, you go to Hades. And there, in Roman and Greek thought, for the righteous, there are good places in Hades, and it, but, but it's still a place to be avoided. Um, and for the wicked, there are really bad places in Hades. So saying hell there is probably better than saying Hades because for a, for a Greek reader, it wouldn't have, uh, 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 Hades could, could be open to some interpretation, but we're, we're giving it what we actually mean by hell in that text. What about in Acts 2.31 when it's saying that Jesus' soul is not left in hell in yeah. a King James yeah. Bible? Yeah. Um, some would argue that Jesus was not in hell or suffering or anything like yeah. that. What, what would you say as far as like a translation? I suspect their grave would be the better term. Um, uh, so. It depends on the context. Everything depends on context. What about Exodus chapter 6, verse 3? And I've noticed this also throughout the Old Testament, and, and we've kind of talked about vowel markings, the name of God. Yeah. And oh gosh, yes. Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, you know, God's talking to Moses. He's saying, I was not known to them by my name, God Almighty, yes. but yes. by my name. And in the King James, it says Jehovah, yeah. whereas in the... Yes. Uh, other versions may say Yahweh. The problem there is fascinating. Uh, this is back to the issue of the Masoretes. What were they doing? Um, they inherited a text that had consonants only. Uh, some consonants were functioning for vowels, but in the name, the, 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 the divine name, uh, the letters were Y-H-W-H. Most names of males in Hebrew are either nouns or verbs. And they t they t typically default to verbs. Uh, Yahweh is the best we can do to pronounce that word, but they didn't want to pronounce it, so they put the vowels for the, let for the, for the word Adonai in it. The, the first letter in, the, in that word in English is A, but in Hebrew it's, a, it's two dots. And that would come into English as uh. The, the second vowel is O. They place that over the, the second consonant. And then the last letter, uh, or the last uh, vowel in Adonai is an A vowel. They put that under the, the, uh, the W. So Yehovah is what that is. But that's, that's called a kathiv kare issue. There are two things going on with that. Kathiv means what is written. What is written is the Y-H-W-H. What is to be read is the vowels. So you're to read Adonai. When I read in Hebrew aloud, um, I always say Adonai for the, for the divine name. Um, that happens all over the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's a text critical issue, number one. Number two, it's a problem of the fact that Hebrew didn't have vowels in its original form. Number three, it's an issue of the tradition of pronunciation that they're bringing to the text. So they, they mark that in the margin uh, with, a, with a letter Q. We would call it Q in, he, in English. And then they tell you what the original reading was. Uh, so they, they, are, they are trying to be very careful with the divine name and not to pronounce it. Jehovah was something that nobody ever said in history until Europeans got hold of the Hebrew Bible trying to figure out what was going on. 
didn't understand what the rabbis were doing. And so that's where Jehovah comes from. What about the name of Jesus? Um, I, I've been given a translation from my father. It's called the Tree of Life version. You've probably never heard of it. I yeah. don't know. It's pretty I've cool. heard of it. I don't know anything like about it. Text. Yeah. But in the New Testament specifically, they actually change every name of God to a Hebrew okay. name. So, in fact, Jesus is never found or the Holy Ghost. It's, yeah. uh, it's Yeshua. Pardon, pardon my Yeah, no, that's, that's but, as good as anybody else can do. Uh, what would you say as far as the name of our Savior? Is it, is it Jesus, in your opinion, or is it Yeshua? Or Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yeshua is uh, an Aramaic form of the name. Um, his name in Hebrew would have been Yehoshua, Joshua. Um, when, since Hebrew, Greek doesn't have the sh sound that Hebrew does, um, then they used a sigma s. And they have case endings, so they tried to retain their case endings uh, for Jesus, Yesu, Yesu, or um, Yesun. Um, so they, they had the case endings. Um, Jesus then comes from Latin via Greek through Aramaic from Hebrew. <laughs> okay, So uh, the I in, in Greek, he, uh, Latin didn't have a J either, but when it functioned as like our Y does as a consonant, then it had the Y sound, they put a little tail on it, thus ending up with our letter J. Um, J-E-S-U-S, -S, that's where we get Jesus. So the answer is yes. It's um, coming from the underlying Greek, Jesus, it's, it's all there. It's all consistent. When it comes to the name of Jesus, would you say that the Greek underlying the New Testament is more authoritative for the name or, or some kind of Hebrew? No, nah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it, what we have in the New Testament is authoritative. His name is Jesus. Um, so if I call him Jesus when I get to heaven, he will answer. If I call him Jesus, he will answer. If I call him Yeshua, he will answer. If I call him Yehoshua, if he will answer. And if I call him Lord or Kyrios or Adonai, he will answer. So, <laughs> so he knows me, he, he knows my language and knows what I'm trying to do. I think I've gotten through a lot of my questions that I had. I did want to ask you, you know, some people uh, when it comes to the English translations, may hold to like a King James only position. What is your opinion about someone who would say the King James Bible is superior to other English versions? It is an amazing. I, I am I am always stunned by the excellence of that translation. I I cannot believe people in the 17th century when when Hebrew was was still, our, our knowledge of Hebrew was still in its infancy. I cannot believe the towering achievement they, they have brought. It is an incredible translation. I love it. I was raised with the King James. I still quote the King James. I can't quote it otherwise. Um, but, but in my reading, um, public reading, I, I will use one of the more modern translations because almost nobody in the circles that I s travel in use the King James anymore. Um, now, I, this is terrible, and I please forgive me for saying this, and if you want to block this out, it's all right. I, I mostly preach and teach from the Greek and Hebrew text because um, it keeps me honest. It reminds me of, of what's going on in the text, and I have to be able to comment on and what where, where my case is weak. I know when it's weak because I... I'm reading the text. Does that make sense to you? Sure. Um, I guess the question for some people would be which Greek, right? And, and it's from, which remind me again. This, that's the Nestle Allen, the, the critical text. But if I were reading from this one or this one, it wouldn't change what I'm saying. So in your opinion, the Scrivener, I think it's. I think it was like 1884. 1881. The the TR 1555 is what we had on the screen. If there were a variation between that and the Nestle Elan, you would give more preference. I would look at the. I would look at the manuscript evidence and make a decision. I the the Nestle Elan I disagree with from time to time.
if there were a doctrinal dispute um, based on the variance, what would what would settle that? If there were a doctrinal dispute, then it would be a matter of each one taking one's own position and saying, okay, what are we going to do with this? Can we agree on the, the variant? If we can't, then okay, then we'll agree to disagree. I, I, I'm a Baptist by, by upbringing, so if you ask me to baptize you, I'm going to immerse you. You know, <laughs> that, that, that I, I cannot do otherwise. But if you come to me and you say, I was, I was sprinkled, uh, I will say, was it as an act after you came to Christ? Yes. It's fine. I'll, I'll take that. We disagree on these things. But that doesn't mean you're not saved. You're my brother in Christ. You're my sister in Christ. I'm going to accept you. So being saved is not a part of baptism? No. What would you say someone that's seeking salvation, what is, what is your position on that? What does someone have to do? Uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Would you say that the, someone could lose that salvation for any reason? I would not. And, and in your opinion, is it just kind of a one-time simple faith and trust in Christ? Or is it well, like a lifestyle? Faith is never simple. It's, it's a life. It's, it's what you are. It's not what you do. It's what you are. You live in a relationship with the living God through the person of Jesus Christ. Let's say perhaps someone believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, but his life's not changing. He's not really serving yeah. the Lord. He's, he's just... In fact, he doesn't do anything good. Would no. he still make it to heaven by that trusting in Jesus? I, I can't evaluate his soul. I can't evaluate what his faith really was. I had a pastor friend years ago who was a, a student at Howard Payne, not Howard Payne, uh, Mary, Mary Harden Baylor out in West Texas. And he said uh, he stayed with an elderly couple. And of course, for me, the word elderly meant, you know, Older. 40 at that time. <laughs> but but uh, they were in their 50s. He, he got a room, rented a room from them while I was at the school. Uh, and very early, as he was visiting with them before he moved in, he heard a baby crying upstairs. And he said, oh, do you have a, a baby in the house? Yeah. Is that your grandson? They said, no, it's our son. And they were in their 50s. And he was passingly surprised at that. He said, uh, how old is the child? They said, he's 20-something years old. Um, he, the child had some kind of a growth malady that never allowed the, the kid to mature to full maturity. Uh, when someone comes to the Lord, oh my goodness, I'm sorry I didn't turn my ringer off. Uh, when someone comes to the Lord, the environment in which the conversion occurs can be such that they're left without proper nourishment. Our daughter in Little Rock has two adopted daughters. They were they were born into a family of drug abusers and of physical abuse and that has changed their brain chemistry and it's not going to ever change back. So it's possible that a church could so hamper the growth of a person. Uh, I, I think this was the situation I was in. I, I was 30 years as a believer before I started really growing. And I had graduated from seminary and was teaching in a Bible college by the time the Lord finally conveyed to me the, the, the real wonder that is His grace. Um, for me, the gospel was good for my past and it was great for my future. It was horrible for right now because God is really angry at everything that I do. And so I was just stunted in my growth for 30 years as a Christian. Um, so that fellow, I, I don't know his heart. I, I can't say what's going on. Would you say, though, that someone could be, a, could be saved by faith without works, like in the sense that they just had no works in their life, but they did have the right. faith alone? Um, faith, when people are, are healthy spiritually, grace will produce works. But our churches are not feeding people. And when you don't feed a child, he doesn't grow. 
So, so I don't want to say too much and I don't want to say too little on that. I see. Okay. When you said you grew up Baptist, is that like from a Southern Baptist yeah. church or? Yeah. Okay. My wife uh, was, was raised Southern Baptist. Her father's a minister in the Southern Baptist church. My, pa my father-in-law was a pastor as well. So. Okay. <laughs> so I have a lot of knowledge about the Southern Baptist Church. What this church here is this affiliated with the Southern Baptist? No, it's it's uh, independent. Okay. Uh, it was affiliated, as I mentioned earlier, with the um, Cumberland Presbyterians, till they really abandoned Scripture and they pulled out of this uh, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Um, we have a seminary down t down in Toward Town. Uh, here from the Cumberland Presbyterians. A friend of mine went there, and he, he was a new student, and uh, walked in one day, and, and a fellow student said, what's that under your arm? He said, it's a Bible. He said, uh, why are you bringing that? He said, well, I want to be a pastor. I want to learn to teach the Bible. He said, leave it home. You won't need it here. So this church pulled out of that denomination and, and uh, uh, is Bible preaching, gospel preaching uh, church. The pastor is, is really strong on evangelism. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a staff pastor who is um, taking the lead in, in evangelizing in the area. And so um, it's everything that I grew up with, <laughs> but it's not Southern Baptist. I understand. Yeah. Sure. It seems like a lot of non-denominational churches kind of have a a Southern Baptist um, history, uh, even, th even though they may not be associated officially. A, former pastor of my, a friend of mine who was pastor here uh, said something that I don't understand. I still don't know what he meant. I, I need to call him and find out what he meant by it. But he said, everybody in Memphis is a Baptist. He said, there are Methodist Baptists and there are Presbyterian Baptists and there are Catholic Baptists and there are Baptist Baptists, but everybody's a Baptist. I still don't understand entirely what he means. But I don't know if I know what that means. I, know, I, don't, I certainly don't. <laughs> So. I would say it's more like everybody's a Catholic, but uh, um, <clears throat> one other one other thought I want. Some people would say that if you alter uh, a particular verse, so let's say you know within within um, NIV, and and I've heard pastors like Greg Mott, who is a, a major influencer in the Southern Baptist Convention. He's at the First Baptist Church in Houston. He said that he's not going to use the NIV 2011 version anymore because they're going like gender neutral. And so like from his perspective, that's too corrupt or too varying from the text, right? Would you agree or do you agree with that opinion as far as like a 2011 NIV or? I haven't been in the text to see what they're doing. Um, there are places where uh, anthropos, for example, is used. We get our word anthropology from it. And it clearly is referring to men and women. Um, the, the problem is where Paul constantly refers to brothers in his writings. Uh, and he's obviously not excluding women. Uh, brother is a very gender-specific word in Greek as it is in English. And so people are saying, Let's not exclude the women, you know. Uh, I'm a little less comfortable with that. If you, if you say people for anthropos, that's a perfectly legitimate translation of that word. Or, or, or person, anthropos, perfectly legitimate. Frater, frater uh, nah, uh, that's brother. So perhaps that's too far. What about someone that would say they just reject the NIV as a whole because it removes... 16 verses. Yeah. Well, okay. Do you have a, does it matter? Uh, there, there, there is a problem in Matthew six or Mark 16 that I think disqualifies the passage, and that is, um, it appears that that Mark that that passage is summarizing events in the Gospel of in the Book of Acts and in. Uh, some of the other Gospels. And one which appears to be summarizing the trip to Emmaus um, says um, that they came back to Jerusalem and told the, the people that they had seen Jesus and they did not believe them. Luke says they did. 
Well, that's a contradiction between two passages. I'm going with Luke. And if that's a contradiction, then that passage, Mark 16, 9 to 20, is disqualified as, as being scripture, uh, from my point of view. Sure, and even, you know, there's a lot of variants on Mark 16, maybe like Pentecostal. Oh, there's uh, profoundly, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not so worried about the Pentecostal issue, but, but a contradiction in scripture I got problems with. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I really appreciate you giving us a lot of time oh, sure. here yeah. and, and talking about a lot of issues. And I, I think it'd be hard to find someone that uh, has that much experience with Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> especially today. Um, it seems like modern scholarship relies too much on tools rather than studying things themselves. So I, do you have any questions for us? No, or? I'm, I'm just thankful that you give me the, uh, this opportunity, and I'm a little surprised. There are far more authoritative people that you could have talked to than I, but... Thank you for including me in this. Yeah, well, we, we appreciate you giving us the time and the energy so that we can accurately reflect, you know, different viewpoints and everything like that. So thank you very much, Mr. Allman. Sure. Good to meet you both. <laughs>